Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. The Defence Secretary deploys HMS Diamond to the Red Sea after missiles and drones target commercial shipping. And he's sending RAF spy planes on a mission to the Middle East. I'll move heaven and earth to bring our hostages home. And the UK Ministry of Defence will conduct these surveillance flights over the eastern Mediterranean, including operating in airspace over Israel and Gaza. Mike and I are joined by a former Royal Navy commander to talk through how these deployments will work and what they can achieve. We'll also explain another mission closer to home, a Royal Navy task force deploying with allies to protect undersea cables. And we ask, how much has the study of military history shaped the wars of today and how they're fought? If I was any good at my profession, I'd put down a good chunk of it to my understanding of history. I was lucky because I love history, so it wasn't a great hardship. Zitrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Uh, so, Mike, uh, more British military personnel and hardware operating in the Middle East, not there to be part of the war per se, but still another strong signal that the Israel-Hamas war and its wider consequences are not something we can stay out of altogether. No, um, and from the very beginning of this crisis on the 7th of October, we immediately started to think about the broader regional implications, bringing in the, um, the, the possibility of Hezbollah in Lebanon, which links it to Iran, the, even the Houthis in Yemen, which links it to Iran, uh, issues on the West Bank, which also partly links it to Iran, but also to issues on the West Bank. And what we've seen is the, the war, as it were, grumbling away in the wider uh, region. And so a lot of powers, but, but certainly the United States and Britain, they're concerned with first the, you know, defending their own interests in this, but also helping to contain the crisis. And also increasingly, I think, to try to mitigate some of the humanitarian effects of it. So, you know, military force is being used with a, a range of purposes, which is what, you know, military force is really quite good at doing. Well, let's start with the deployment of HMS Diamond. She was already on her way to the region when missiles and drones were launched against three commercial ships in the Red Sea, including two UK-owned cargo vessels. US Central Command says the attacks were launched by Iranian-backed Houthi forces in Yemen and that the USS Kani provided assistance, including shooting down a number of drones. Let's bring in Tom Sharp, who commanded four British warships during his Royal Navy career. Tom, good to have you on sit rep you understand the detail of this attack a lot better how significant is this threat to shipping in the red sea it's very significant and this weekend was something of an escalation although it's been grumbling along there actually since since 2014 when they when they first kind of moved in when the houthis first first moved in but it's been active an active area since uh, the 19th of october actually i think was the first one where carney uh, USS Kearney intercepted uh, three cruise missiles and 15 drones. And that was the day everyone went, hang on, so the, the Houthis have not got the memo uh, that seemingly Hezbollah got, courtesy of the USS Gerald R. Ford and all the, all the US ships that are massed in the eastern Mediterranean. And I say this with real caution, but they seem to have calmed things a little bit there. The 19th of October made very, very clear that the Houthis haven't got that memo. And, and ever since then, uh, I count seven... Uh, pockets of attacks of various sorts, uh, starting with that one that the Carney got. Then there have been drones. Then there was the helicopter uh, piracy uh, event, which was a significant uh, deviation from the Houthi normal operating pattern. Then there was an, a failed boarding out in the in the Gulf of Aden. So this was this weekend was was the sort of seventh uh, version of these uh, attacks. So it's very hot there, and and mm. the ships that are there are going to have to be on their game. And on those ships, can you tell us a bit more about HMS Diamond and what she can actually do to protect merchant vessels in the Red Sea? Yeah, well, she could do quite a lot just in terms of just being a warship. Let's start there. So before we get to the fact that she's an air defence destroyer, um, she can do an awful lot in terms of presence, just being there and getting in the way, responding at high speed to emergency calls, if necessary, picking up vessels and, and taking them through the the Bab al Mandab at the bottom of the Red Sea, which is the, the choke point that the Houthis uh, are kind of you know right next to. It's very busy, uh, one of the busiest sort of shipping lanes in the world. Uh, and so just being there and making herself 
at large will be will be useful now whether it comes to when it comes to shooting things down of course that's a, that's another question yeah this is not risk free for hms diamond and her crew what is their job going to be like it's a pretty horrible place to operate at the best of times down there. The sea surface temperature is very warm. So so from an engineering perspective, the marine engineer always wants to get through the Red Sea and out into the into the Gulf as quickly as possible because you're you're, you're dragging in. You're, it's a difficult place to operate your engines and everything else. Then it's hard for your sensors. Um, radar ranges are generally pretty reduced because of the heat and surface ducting and all these sort of scientific reasons, but your radar doesn't work particularly well. Although in, in, in the Type 45, we do have one of the best air defense radars in the world. So fingers crossed that's not too bad. Um, it's very busy, as I said, but not just commercial shipping. You get smuggling activities left and right, and they dart across in these very small, very fast wooden boats that don't really paint on the radar. Visibility is poor quite often because it's dusty. Uh, so it's not a fun place to operate, even if you're just going through, if you're going from A to B, th- from Suez, through the Red Sea to to the Indian Ocean or wherever. It's not much fun there. So to stay there and be on task there is going to be uh, it's going to be demanding. Yeah, Mike, HMS Lancaster, along with two Royal Fleet auxiliaries, were deployed when the Israel-Hamas war began in October. Is this turning into a a long-term deployment? Yes, it might do. And two things have emerged in the in the last week, which might turn out to be very important for Britain. One is that the Americans are talking about creating a joint maritime task force down near the Bab el-Mandeb Straits that Tom was talking about in the Red Sea to try to protect that sea lane. And HMS Diamond might find itself involved in that, might. But that's been talked about actively mm. in Washington. And the second thing, just in the last few hours, uh, Grant Shapps, the British Defence Secretary, has been talking about maybe delivering humanitarian aid to Gaza by sea from Cyprus so that stuff could be loaded in Cyprus, presumably onto one of the on the Lion Bay or the Argus and taken to the coast of Gaza. And I was looking at, well, what sort of port facilities they've got? Mm. There's a port of Gaza, but it's just a fishing port. So there is a sort of facility there, but it would be pretty challenging to deliver aid you know directly by sea into gaza but it's an active possibility and the british are looking at it i mean i know lime bay and argus have been have been the most patient patient ships uh, out there because they were there right at the start and they've been doing a quite a lot of hurry up and wait uh, ever since uh, and uh, i'm not sure the sort of flow of communications between them and and uk government has been particularly uh, rewarding for them i think they've been frustrated as anything so if they could be used in some form or other they are the literal response group which when it was announced uh, its lack of escort or dedicated escort protection always gave people a slight kind of headache because you've got two big units that are, are basically undefended to all intents and purposes and there's a real incredible um missile threat there from from hezbollah that they need to be very careful of so it's it's good news that they are gonna that they are potentially going to be used in their sort of one one of their primary roles but they will that protection will need to be very careful and and i i don't have this confirmed but i'm pretty sure that hms duncan who was the um, nato command ship um, Mm. for the last in fact she's been away for a while up in the aegean and and places is going to be extended on task so it wouldn't surprise Mm. me at all if diamond scoots past and goes through the red sea to plug into whatever construct the us are putting in there and duncan stags on for duties to protect the literal response group should they go inshore because the minute you start going in the minute you get within 200 miles of the coast you're in the missile envelope for uh, for hezbollah and they'll need protecting and tom on those houthi attacks the uk has one warship in the red sea the us have quite a few which pack a bigger punch so far they stayed defensive they've not tried to strike back at the source of these attacks how long do you think that can last yeah, that's the. This is the million dollar question, and and for those who those of us who have operated at sea over many years with the Americans, are scratching our heads a little bit as to why nothing has been done. When the when the USS Mason was was shot at in 2016 uh, by the Houthis down in the Southern Red Sea, almost immediately there was a counter a TLAM counter strike on key radar sites. Now, given the resources that have gone past that point, you've got the 26 MEU, the USS Bataan. They have special forces on board. The Ohio-class SSGN, 154 Tomahawks on board and special forces. The entire Eisenhower strike group went past. All the while, these pot shots were being taken, and yet nothing's been done in return. So 
um, disciplined restraint is, is what I'm calling it, only because that's what we used to operate under in the Gulf. And when I was there in my frigate, it was the Americans called it disciplined restraint. And it was it's not a, it's not a particularly fun way to operate because it feels a little bit like you're taking going to take the first hit. But that is very clearly what they're operating under down there now. And it's it's um, yeah, everyone's just waiting for the strike back. That um, disciplined restraint, uh, Mike, um, any idea why the US hasn't fired back? Oh, well, I think for all the reasons that Tom says, that you, you don't, they don't want to escalate it. I mean, there have been a couple of U.S. strikes into um, Darazor, for instance, which is right on the, the border of uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, and a couple of others. I mean, there's been like two strikes um, in, in order to show um, Tehran, really, that it won't get too many free hits. But there is a sense in which, uh, I think, as Tom said, you know, if if one of the uh, Western ship really does take a hit from something, it will be difficult not to uh, initiate some sort of retaliatory strike or, re- or go after the place where these missiles are being fired from. So, you know, we are getting ourselves into a situation where, you know, disciplined restraint, heroic restraint probably will only go so far if the situation continues to escalate. Mike, um, let's talk about the RAF deployment now. Uh, Surveillance planes tasked with searching for British hostages taken by Hamas, initially Shadow R1 aircraft. How capable are they? Oh, yes. The Shadow R1, the old, the old Beechcraft aircraft. We, I mean, some, some of us remember going around Afghanistan in the old Beechcraft. And that's what they are, uh, a, a, a new version of the uh, twin-engined conventional prop aircraft. And they stooge around. That's the point. They've got, uh, the, they've got good range. They're very reliable. And they carry a lot of uh, electro-optical and electro, uh, electronic sensors so they can simply absorb material from the ground. They can look and listen to what's going on, which is why they will perform it intelligence role they can't defend themselves but they do have a sort of defense suite a DAS a defense assistance suite so they'll know if something's targeting them and if they're if they're being used anywhere around Gaza I would expect that a couple of typhoons would be stooging around to um, ride shotgun for them I can't believe that they'd be flying up and down um, on their own um, but that would be an operational decision for the RAF of course. And do they have any realistic hope of helping find these hostages? Well, they might. I mean, they, they won't be able to detect hostages, you know, being held underground or whatever, but they'll be monitoring the chatter on the ground. They'll also be able to monitor movement on the ground. And so if groups of hostages, because we assume that the 137 hostages who are still in captivity are not being held in, in 100 different places, there must be large groups of them together. And it's very much in the interests of Hamas to keep these people alive because they're no good to them if they're not alive. And so you assume that quite large groups of them may start to be being moved around, albeit in the tunnels or whatever, but there may be areas where they have to move on the surface, or there may be indications on the surface that something's happening in the tunnels. You, you just don't know. But at least if you've got these, um, the R1s, uh, as it were, monitoring, then there's a mm-hmm. chance that they may pick up something which is helpful, because this has to be an intelligence-led operation, and that's what they're for. Well, as I mentioned at the start, another big naval deployment has been announced closer to home, a task force of six Royal Navy ships plus a Royal Fleet auxiliary vessel to work with allies from the Joint Expeditionary Force, trying to protect undersea cables from the English Channel to the Baltic Sea. And RAF P-8 Poseidon Maritime Patrol aircraft will also be part of the effort. Uh, Tom, it sounds like a fairly sizable deployment, but there are many thousands of miles of cable there there are but it's i think this is great news and i think between between this deployment and the the taking up of trade of the rfa uh, proceus it really now feels like uh, the government is taking the business of protecting our energy and our communications uh, seriously now that this jeff construct the joint expeditionary force construct under which these six ships in fact it's six plus one there was an rfa already there and the poseidon is a great way to do it it's a, you're right it's a huge area and they won't be there for very long there's no real persistence to this deployment so it's not perfect but it's a pretty good start and yes you can't police everything but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try and at least get out there and make yourself large up your electronic signatures let let the russians know that you're there uh, and that you're watching them uh, i think so i think it's very valid can you tell us a little bit more about the ships involved and what they can do and the potential limitations 
Yes, two frigates, two patrol vessels, and two mine mine hunters. So kind of a, a bit of everything. The ones that will really get sort of stuck in, if you like, will be the will be the frigates purely because they've got sonars that they can use to detect underwater activity, and they've got considerably more speed, uh, and they'll be better in in rough weather as well, which I think we can probably assume uh, in the far north at this time of year. So so the frigates will be in the in the lead and then the patrol vessels and the and the mcms the mine countermeasures vessels will be more further inshore i, I wouldn't want necessarily to take a, an mcm up there at this time of year um i hope they've got their seasickness tablets yeah and you mentioned tom rfa proteus the, the new ship that's being commissioned specifically for this job how long before she's actually ready to do these patrols and will she bring any new capability to the job yeah, I'm hearing slightly mixed messages actually from within on her, partly, well, mainly from a, from a crewing perspective. Uh, the RFA is in terrible trouble right now with, with crewing. Uh, recruitment and retention, well, it's poor across defence. In fact, it's poor globally in the maritime. But the RFA is so small and therefore so vulnerable to, to the ebbs and flows that they're in, they're in a tricky spot right now, which is awkward because we're putting quite a lot of emphasis on the RFA these days. Um, so that's a long way of saying she's not ready yet. She has a mandated docking period early next year. It's slightly unfortunate that we've just taken her sort of as she was approaching this cycle, didn't just get straight to it. But nevertheless, when she comes out of that, depending on what equipment she has on her upper deck, and she has this tremendous sort of uh, lifting uh, and storage capability uh, and dynamic positioning and all these things that will make her very, very suitable for this task. And, and the exciting thing is it's proactive. Everything we generally do in the sort of anti-submarine spaces is reactive. A Russian mm. submarine deploys, we go and intercept it and, and go and do the stuff. In this case, it's not it's not quite spying, um, but it's but it's but it's not far off it, and that's and that's great. We should be we should definitely be in that game, and that's what she brings. Yeah, that's really interesting. And Mike, um, when we talk about protecting our undersea cables, we usually discuss the threat to our data connections, but we also rely on them for electricity to an extent, don't we? Mm. Yes, I was doing some work some time ago on the electricity grid as part of critical national infrastructure. And I was actually mm. quite surprised to discover how international it is because we have major links. Uh, part of the grid goes from Norway to the Shetlands and to Scotland and to the east of England. And then we have a grid that goes or links that come from Denmark, from the Netherlands, from Belgium, from France, and there is also uh, a, quite a big link to and from Iceland. And if you look at the distances here, you're talking about, uh, you know, about, I don't know, 1,100 kilometres from Iceland to northern Scotland, to the northern tip of Scotland, another mm. almost 2,000 kilometres uh, into the mainland of Europe. So you're talking about a, a, an electricity grid that covers, it's called the European grid, it covers, you know, eight or nine countries, and it's, it's, it, there's a lot of undersea cabling involved in that, just long lengths of electricity grid cabling and my goodness we need it because we're now in a an era where electricity supplies will be much more volatile than ever before we can't just take them for granted and europe needs the ability to move electricity around in northern europe as it responds to shortages outages and uh, surges in demand let me just get a final thought from both of you on this. We've talked about three different open-ended missions getting underway, but the forces are there to respond to events. How significant is the increased ask of our forces from this time last week? Yeah, I, I just think this is indicative. The fact that we're talking about three big events, we're talking mainly about naval stuff this week for good reasons. It is an example of the fact that we now ask our forces to be busier than ever, doing a wider range of things than ever. And, you know, the way the world is going, we are moving into a new dark age of insecurity. And we need our forces more than we've ever needed them, not just since the end of the Cold War, but since the teeth of the Cold War, since the worst of the Cold War. And we are asking so much of them, and yet we don't give them the support nationally that they need. They, we don't give them the range. The, uh, you know, as Tom says, there's a problem of recruitment. We haven't woken up to the fact we, we need our forces to be more agile and more multi-skilled than ever before. And we're not just not facing it. And this week's news, I think, is just another example of the problem that we've given ourselves. Yes, it's it's a question of diverging resources, and and I think I've been studying the U.S. Navy movements as well over the last few weeks, just to see how taut they are. And so they'll be desperate for a, for any coalition support, which we're providing, which is great. But it comes with a bill. All of this comes with a bill. Uh, Duncan, for example, has been away for nine months already this year, 
and now she's being asked to extend. And the, the thing that worries me, I'm not hearing or seeing any indication out of the Treasury that this bill is going to be met. There's sticking plasters being applied occasionally. There's talk of increasing the percentage of GDP, but it's only ever talk. And I just think at the moment, with all the with all the uncertainty across the sort of across the government, uh, I, I don't hold any hope in extra money being allocated. And then, of course, historically, something breaks, and you then have to fix it anyway, and it works out much more expensive um, uh, retrospectively. So that that's what's troubling me. N- nothing. No one's indicating that this increased bill is is going to be met in any in any sensible way. Tom Sharp, great to speak to you. Thank you for your time today. News, discussions and analysis. This is SITREP. Now, when we talk on SITREP about the latest conflict to break out somewhere in the world, we often turn to conflicts of the past as we try to explain how it might all play out. But how much does military history and its study really shape modern wars? In a moment, we'll get the thoughts of a former chief of the defence staff and a military historian. But first, another very experienced military mind. General Sir Mike Jackson, whose career included commanding 3rd Mechanised Division and leading international troops in the Balkans before he became Chief of the General Staff. What part did the study of military history play in his career? Well, it starts as an officer cadet at Sandhurst, where, as I remember, quite a bit of academic syllabus time was indeed military history. But, you know, you join the army, you're obviously interested in what has gone before and that your own personal reading is is important. Do you learn, for example, manoeuvre, how great generals manoeuvred their forces? And one of the earliest examples I remember is Hannibal's invasion of the Roman Empire, for two reasons at least. One is his use of the indirect approach, otherwise known as right flanking through the Alps. And the other, of course, is his extraordinary victory at Cannae, where he used double envelopment to basically destroy the Roman army uh, he was up against. And can you recall any specific moments when you drew on military history to make a decision or or to make a battle plan? I don't think A to B or C, but the uh, campaigns I was most closely involved with were the Balkans, the Bosnia, uh, 95, 96, Kosovo, 99. Each set of circumstances is is different. Even those two Balkan conflicts uh, were different. But one could draw on previous counterinsurgency campaigns and studying absolute textbooks such such as um, Malaya. It's about how you deal my good friend Rupert Smith's phrase is very apposite, war amongst the people. Ground doesn't matter so much in modern war, where you are, you are dealing with people's attitudes and beliefs and their, their own view of their own history. How much do you think the conflicts that you fought have shaped military actions today? Yeah, interesting. Bosnia, my lessons from Bosnia is that you must have a mandate which allows to seriously influence, we'll call it the battlefield. The UN Protection Force, UNPRO 4 in Bosnia, did not have that mandate. When it came to Kosovo, it, it was a NATO operation with less, uh, how to put it, um, hesitation than the UN had displayed in Bosnia. General Sir Mike Jackson, it's been really good to speak to you. Thank you very much for your time. Not at all.
Well, we can talk now to the historian and broadcaster Lucy Betridge Dyson and General Lord Richards, former Chief of the Defence Staff. His career includes commanding British troops in East Timor and Sierra Leone and NATO forces in Afghanistan. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining me on SITREP. Um, Lord Richards, uh, you're well known as an extensive reader of military history. Did you ever have any moments in your career on operations when you went into your mental archive for advice or inspiration? Well, two quick responses. Uh, one is, I don't think if you're at short notice and you're sent off to some obscure part of the world, you can quickly look up what the last chap who had the misfortune or good fortune to do this uh, learned because uh, the pressure of events is such that it's almost impossible. So I do think I'd say, as a general rule, the study of history has got to be something that you live and grow up with and study all your life, so that when you find yourself on commanding an operation, it's your instinct that you're falling back on, instinct forged in part by your study of history. But a specific point is when I went to Afghanistan, I did have time to prepare properly for it. And I looked at various things about the history of Afghanistan and uh, also what, for example, Field Marshal Templer did in Malaya in sort of similar circumstances. Uh, and I found as a result, I knew much more than the political and military leadership that were actually deploying me. And that led to a lot of arguments, I can tell you, and still does. And you mentioned that, um, OK, you can't sort of delve into a history book there and then when you're out in the field. But um, those instincts that you built on your knowledge of military history, did you ever find that they, they actually let you down? Yes, I do think you've got to be very careful. And I'll be fascinated to hear what Lucy thinks. But I do think that you've got to be very careful, and this is a, an old adage in a way, to be careful you don't fight the last war. So it's I was looking for principles and concepts that might help me rather than sort of detailed techniques, if you like, because almost certainly things will have moved on or there'll be different factors that uh, one has to apply and you'll let yourself down. So what do you think, Lucy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the key point here is, you know, when we study military history, we're looking at a number of things. You know, yes, we're looking at sort of the operational aspects. We're looking at how battles unfolded. Uh, we're also looking at how military systems, military organisations learn. That's a big, big part of it, how these things develop. But also, and probably more importantly, we're looking at the more profound questions and the philosophy of war. And I think these are the aspects to which Lord Richards is, is kind of referring is about that if you have that knowledge, if you understand the background to these things and the theories by, you know, Klaus Fitz, Sun Tzu, these kinds of people, that becomes then built into your instincts. And it's those things in, in how we can seek to learn and understand the conflict that's happening now rather than, you know, through the conflicts that happened then. And Lucy, do, does military history from centuries ago influence warfare now or does it lose its value over time? So I think in its most basic form, you know, the answer to that question is, you know, that which has gone before always influences the things that are happening now. So looking to understand that is only ever going to improve things. It could be that you're looking to avoid mistakes of the past. It could be that you're looking to just understand the other wider aspects of how conflict has broken out and the conflict you're fighting. Because war isn't just about the battlefields. It's about, you know, the economy. It's about the culture. It's about the zeitgeist of the time. So, you know, yes, it, these things, even conflicts that have happened, you know, centuries ago, as I, as I mentioned before, with Klaus Fitz and Sun Tzu, these, the philosophies that underpin a lot of these sort of seminal works in, in the history of war, much of that hasn't changed and this is the wars that are happening in the world right now. Can we see the influence of military history in the way they're being conducted, do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think if we look at, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the war in Ukraine um, and how that has unfolded in perhaps a way that a lot of people didn't think it, it would. Um, and there are parallels being drawn. I think we have to be careful. Um, with, I've seen a lot of kind of hack analysis on things that I, I don't think is helpful. So I think there very much has to be a, a time uh, and a place for those sort of parallels. And sometimes these things can be a bit distracting. And actually, as Lord Richard said, fighting the war that went before or applying things that maybe made sense in a trench warfare situation in 1916 is not going to 
do the job in Ukraine today. So I think we have to be very careful. But again, this all comes down to structured learning. Um, and, and that's where, you know, actually, if you embed this into the training in, in the military, you know, the study of war, you, you avoid falling into those traps. And Lord Richard, how much do you see military history shaping what's happening in Ukraine right now? Well, picking up Lucy's theme, um, I do see lots of, a lot of parallels with the way at a tactical level previous wars have been fought. But I would just like to bring it back up to the strategic level. I um, studied Russia and the Soviet Union quite a lot when I was a, a younger officer at university. And I can tell you that, and, and Lucy hinted at this, a, a lot of military people and others were anticipating Ukraine's uh, success last year and certainly earlier this year. I was not mainstream thinking on that uh, because I understood from my uh, study of history that Russia is a very resilient country who's been through a lot of pain, that is prepared to accept much greater casualties than uh, any other country probably. And so I anticipated as early as April last year that we were underestimating uh, Russia's resolve and ability to come back. Uh, sadly, mm. in many respects, um, I've been proved right. If you like, we're seeing history play out both at the tactical level in terms of the use of mines and trench warfare and all that sort of thing, brought up to date because of other things like uh, drones and so on, of course. But also we're playing out something that is deeply historic, which is uh, about Russia and how she fights wars. Lucy, you were nodding throughout that answer. Do you want to add to it? Yeah, it's, it's just that for me, this plays into the idea that, you know, the role of military history here is in is broadening the lens that we look at war. So if you can understand the history, the culture of, of Russia's military, you know, throughout how it's operated throughout the centuries, then surely you're better informed as to, to make judgments on what might play out today. I think that's the key thing. Lord Richards, what military history that you studied do you think had the most influence on how you planned and operated? Well, I think it's more about how I might have acted as a commander rather than necessarily planned and operated, because uh, without, you know, overfogging it, all situations are unique. Therefore, as a commander, uh, are you flexible, um, do you look after your troops properly? Uh, will they have high morale? All those sort of things, I think, were very important to me. I did have and do have a particularly high regard for Field Marshal Slim, uh, but who doesn't in many respects because mm. he was such a competent and well-loved commander. Funnily enough, I also have a regard for someone that wasn't that popular, and that's uh, Bernard Montgomery, Phil Marshall Montgomery, because one of the things he taught me, which I still believe uh, applies, is that while technology is very important, uh, numbers mass still matter too, as we're seeing played out in Ukraine. And uh, of course, at the moment, the British Armed Forces or our political masters have much bigger ambition for the armed forces that we have the size now to meet. Um, and so numbers matter uh, as well as what you do with them. You mentioned technology, and Lucy, we hear a lot about how modern technology will transform warfare, but technological innovation is written through the history of war. What does that teach us for the transformation of now? For me, we're in a very similar period in, in terms of cyber warfare and the ve development of technology on that front as the First World War with the development of industrialization of warfare. So looking at understanding you know, the things that the British Army did right, the things that they did wrong and how they interpreted that learning, how they got the message out to commanders, to the men on the ground of new tactics, you know, how these things were developed. That's where the real benefits are in studying that, because obviously comparing like for like with technology is never going to work because it's always it's always moving. So it's all about understanding the processes to make these things, you know, useful and wanted to use technology. It's all very well having it, but you want to be able to implement it effectively. And David Rich, how, how much help do you think the study of military history could offer someone starting out their military career now? Well, I think it's vital and long may it last that Sandhurst, for example, young officers, but I think certainly the tactical level, it should be in the curriculum for all junior NCOs as well. It should play a central role. And as, unless things have changed, I, I'm certain it still does. And I 
if I was any good at my profession, I'd put down a good chunk of it to my understanding of history and the ability and the encouragement uh, I received to study uh, history you know, quite early on. As a result of my study of history and doing it a little bit, uh, I'm the biggest peacenik of all time uh, because uh, usually there's a lot of bloodshed and a lot of loss of life and often do you, you don't win. So the imperative is that we understand that, but our political masters realize they don't send us off to war unless our vital national interests are at stake. And at that point, uh, you make sure you're properly resourced to do the job you're asked to do. And Lucy, if you were to throw yourself uh, forward into the future and look back at this particular period and put it into the context of military history, how do you think future historians will see it? Oh, that's a question and a half, isn't it? Um, it's very difficult to say. I mean, I think I think a big thing that will come out of this is, is you know, what I've hinted on before is is how we how we have learned and how the institutions, the British Army, has learned to deal with the changing technology. For me, that's a big thing at the moment. Um, I think also the economy and the other the kind of more, the world influence at the moment. We are uh, in a an interesting phase there, where particularly with the British Army, the budgets have have been less than ideal. So again, how that has been worked out, how we've dealt with the conflicts that have arisen in in recent years in less than ideal circumstances from, from a peacetime perspective. But these are age old arguments, you see. So, you know, it will all link back. Um, I think being in the military, whatever rank you are, you know, I've got some experience with this. I'm a family closely linked to the military. Um, you know, it's a profession. And just as in any profession, if you take an interest in the history of your profession, you're going to be, you know, well informed. That's going to be beneficial. Whether you're private, whether you go to Sandhurst, it doesn't matter. Thank you so much, Lucy Betteridge, Dyson, Lord Richard. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Mike, what came first for you? Is it studying military history or analysing the wars of today? Oh, for me, um, it was history first because I did, as a student and a younger man, I did a certain amount of ancient world history and then 19th and 20th century history. And that was before I really got into defence analysis. So in a way, everything I've done on defence really since the late 80s, 1990, really was the beginning of my real involvement with defence studies was on the basis of a sort of a, an intellectual hinterland in history, which I'm very glad about. And is there a danger that we keep ourselves trapped by history, that actually it can stifle innovation among military planners and leaders? Yes. I mean, there's a very glib comment, you know, that those who are ignorant of history are condemned to repeat it. But of course, as David Richards was saying there, and Lucy as well, I mean, history doesn't really repeat itself, but it does rhyme. It often rhymes. And that's where we're interested. And I think the one doesn't need to be trapped by history, but one should be aware of it, one of the historical rhymes, particularly because there are some eternal verities of command and of warfare. Certain things are fairly constant in warfare. The, the battle for willpower, the need to, you know, to use lethal force to be to be prepared to kill and be killed, to wound and be wounded in the pursuit of an objective. So there are some eternal verities of war and of command that would have been as obvious to Alexander the Great as they were to Montgomery, as they were to David Richards in Sierra Leone. I mean, David mm -hmm. Richards in Sierra Leone was, was conducting a pretty small operation compared, say, to the Duke of Wellington's Peninsula campaign. But it had all the same elements, dealing with allies, having to deal with London that didn't fully understand what was happening there, um, dealing with a, a, an insurgency, dealing with logistics, dealing with costs and so yeah. on. It, it was a sort of micro version of Wellington's Peninsula campaign. I've mentioned that to him once. And he smiled <laughs> ruefully. <laughs> it's an interesting parallel. Um, and just finally, you, you're in the process of finishing your book on great British military commanders. I wonder what they would make of how their history does or doesn't shape today. Yeah, I, I look at it in the last two chapters where I try to look at these 34 individuals from Bodicea to Bomber Harris and uh, then in the last two chapters have a look at what this tells us about modern warfare and it's interesting because I'm talking to modern commanders, I've talked to a lot of people about and I've asked them two questions. What are the eternal verities? And they've all come up with similar answers and then in what ways is the 21st century different? And they've got quite different answers. So some of our commanders take the view that well there are lots of new things but a good commander will just get hold of the new things that's okay but then other commanders have said no no the 21st century throws up things that are beyond our imaginings 
things we mm. can't even begin to imagine. And it took me back to thinking about, you know, Dan Dare and the Eagle comic. When I was a boy, Dan Dare promised me personally that when I was a middle-aged man, I'd be going to the moon for my holidays. And now I'm an old, I'm an old man and I'm still going to Scarborough. So, but in every, in every respect other than travel, and you get the same on Star Trek, incidentally, same sort of promises, but in every respect other than the travel itself, the world is beyond the imaginings of Dan Dare and the Star mm. Trek, in the world of communications, in material science, in our access to information. It's beyond the imaginings of Dan Dare that we could live in the world in which we live. And so some military commanders say there is something fundamental about the this 20th to 21st century era change, which will throw up changes in the nature of warfare that are so far beyond our imaginings that we will need a completely different sort of commander to even begin to grasp them. Mike Clark, the moon still awaits you. Thank you so much, Professor Michael Clark, and all my guests today. That's all for now. We'll be back with another sit rep next Thursday. And if you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel as well as our home at bfbs.com slash sit rep or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye bye. 